Welcome to the Ryan Holt Show. On this show, you can expect the latest, the greatest, and the best curated content on business, marketing, automotive, and lifestyle. Sit back, put in your earplugs, and let's enjoy the ride. Now, as always, I want to make sure you get the best in content that will help you monster your goals, both personally and professionally. I want to keep this conversation going, so please check me out on Twitter, Instagram, and Periscope at RyanHoltz1. And then go over to Facebook.com forward slash Ryan Holtz Marketing and we can chat there too. I also want you to visit www.ryanholtz.ca as this will be where I put my almighty beloved show notes. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, I am proud to bring you the Ryan Holtz Show. Let the beat drop and enjoy. It's a casual. Coolio. Uh, hey, everyone. Welcome to this episode of The Ryan Holt Show. Today, oh, man, I have a, an amazing guest. He's got the all blacks on. He's got the super heroic. I see the glasses. Uh, he, he goes by the name of Jason Maiden. In his previous role at Nike, Jason oversaw the design and execution of all conceptual products, data-driven innovations, and inline lifestyle and performance product for the Jordan brand. As a senior global design director during his 13-plus year at Nike, Maiden led and contributed to the creation of innovations, innovative sport performances, products for athletes and cultural icons such as Carmelo Anthony, Chris Paul, Russell Westbrook, Derek Jeter, and the almighty MJ. In 2012, Maiden successfully received his master's in general management and social innovation from Stanford University's Graduate School of Business. And shortly thereafter, he returned to Nike as the global director of innovation for Nike Digital Sport, where he was responsible for the strategic investigation of new technology technologies and services such as the nike feel band jason your bio is too good you're doing too much work i gotta still finish (laughs) most recently jason was the vp of design at mark one an iot startup focusing on the intersection of consumption and behavior change maiden is also a ddot fellow and media designer at the hassle plate near institute of design at stanford university a frequent lecturer at stanford university's prestigious graduate school of business a regular columnist blogger for Hypebeast Magazine and Hypebeast.com and an advisory board member to his undergraduate alma mater, the College for Creative Studies. He's now at Excel, assisting with the continuous development of Excel's brand position amongst the global community of entrepreneurs while working with portfolio companies on depending and extending their knowledge and ability to create cultures of curiosity. Moreover, he's also an advisor of Slice, a company created by fellow Nike alum Brian Barr and NBA superstar Stephen Curry, a platform focused on creating a new paradigm at the intersection of campaign workflow planning and brand to influencer content management. Lastly, he's the CEO and co-founder of Super Heroic, a business focused on providing quality play performance footwear, apparel and technology for elementary school age children. Jason, welcome to the show, my friend. Thank you, Kay. First off, uh, my first question is simple. What What's for dinner tonight? Uh a good question. Uh, well, before <laughs> dinner, you know, we'll get out and play. We'll go to what's called Christmas Tree Lane here oh. in Palo Alto. We'll go and hang out and look at some of the, the lights and how people have decorated their homes. And, and then we'll figure out what to eat. But normally, it's usually healthy, clean. My wife's an amazing cook. I pitch in and, and, and do my thing. Um, and then my kids pitch in and do their thing. So, yeah, man, we keep it pretty simple, pretty clean. Yeah. And just to add to the bio, I'm, I'm putting my own little spin on it. One of the biggest reasons I wanted to chat with you is I just think you're an overall humanitarian. Um, I don't know. Some I, I look, I've listened to a lot of your interviews and kind of you know did my digital deep dive on you, and I think that it just seems like you're you're for the underdog in certain ways, and you're you're real real dude. And um, I, I don't know. I, I think my next question goes into I know you are married, but if you wanted your wife to wear and you could only pick one sneakers or a nice pair of stilettos, what would it be? <laughs> uh, if I, I mean one. I, I don't think it's my choice to, to to pick or tell her what to wear. I think um, so. Let me let me preface my remarks by saying that um, I put both in front of her. You know, you know, sneakers that you know uh, are rare and she can care less because she doesn't follow the culture, which is why I married her because we see the world differently, and that's important to find balance. Um, so I would say a, a comfortable, active shoe that she can wear in between any outfit, whether it's casual or it's performance i think ultimately as long as it's comfortable and fly i'm good with it but i'm anti i'm anti muppet feet i'm not gonna name the company but there's a certain boot 
that's very comfortable that reminds me of Muppet feet. And it's just, <laughs> do, you, do you do actually legit? And I got to show you this, but uh, I, I'm obsessed with feet and we'll get into that later. But my actual business card is a, uh, is a sock. If you can see that. And it's, 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 it, I got, I, I got an extreme issue with like, even my wife, she kind of laughs because we will be walking or whatever. And she, you know, I, I don't, it's not that I look at a woman's, you know, butt or, or anything like that. But as soon as my eyes go to below the ankle, she's like, yo, dude, you got to stop doing this right now. And I'm like, I, I just can't help it. I just can't help it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I just want to kind of get you to start out at, I know where you are right now. And I know that uh, a little bit about where you're coming from. Uh, I think the journey is really, really important. Um, I did watch a TED talk and you got extremely emotional uh, in it. And you were talking about a friend uh, back in the day who had, who had got shot. And you said this was a, a pinnacle wow. moment um, for, you know, for, 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 for your life. And just to kind of give you the context, I mean, a lot of my listeners are in Canada. I got a lot in the United States. Um, I'm a, a, a half Jamaican, half German, uh, dude, but in Canada, I'm just a black dude, but, uh, I do have a lot of, uh, experience with the United States and, and the whole culture of African American and, and things that are going on there, especially with the South side of Chicago. Why for you is this such a pinnacle moment in kind of leading you to where you are now? Yeah. I mean, I, I think you have to look at it, um, through the lens of prescriptive, I would say savagery, which is essentially what Chicago is. And when the reason I say it's prescribed savagery or prescriptive savagery is it's, it's an experiment with people's lives. When you take away certain resources, you create certain policies, you use gerrymandering and redlining to restructure what communities look like. And then you step back and you watch self-destruction take root. Mm. And then you criticize that self-destruction. You ridicule that self-destruction. You use that self-destruction to gain political chips with your constituents is an unfortunate set of circumstances because the whole narrative is not explored. People look at people like myself, uh, and big ups to, you know, to T dot to, mm. you know, I love T dot <laughs> always been Windsor, the whole thing, man. Like yeah. I love Canada. Yeah. My wife, my wife from British Columbia, so. Oh, wait a uh, sec. Wait a sec. We're in British Columbia. Yeah. I'm, I'm so sitting she, in British Columbia right now. Now you yeah, got so me excited. <laughs> so she uh, was born in Vancouver, but okay. her family is all in, in Colombia in South America. So she's Colombian and British Columbian. So okay. Hilarious. Okay. Uh, Ask her if she's ever heard of where uh, Cranbrook or Fairmont, BC is. It's kind of northern, northern BC. But have you been to British Columbia before? Oh uh, yeah, a lot. Oh lots, okay. Lots of, lots of friends in Burnaby. Lots of friends at EA up there. Yeah. Good up there, so. Yeah. I love BC. It's one of my. I tell people Vancouver is my favorite city on the planet. We shot the campaign for Super Heroic there. Okay. Uh, and stuff. Damn. Yeah, you know, That's good. Yeah. So. <laughs> Um, so what's interesting, you know, like like I mentioned about my journey is that we often hear about the kids from the inner city and what we overcame, but we never talk about why those obstacles were present in the first place. Mm. No one gives themselves unfortunate circumstances. That's just not how life is. You don't choose to be born into a bad neighborhood. And bad neighborhoods aren't something that just happened. They're created. Mm. And when you look at the fact that poverty is created, um, just like jobs is created, poverty mm. is created. Mm. Um, then you say, okay, these children still have to survive and navigate and be prepared to go into a workforce or into the world and perform with limited resources, limited development opportunities. Why I say that my origin story is so critical is because I wanted people to know what can be considered a tragic event became transform transformative for me because I realized the preciousness of not only my life, but other people's lives, but also the importance of carrying forward despite wherever I come from mm. and succeeding because I know that my journey, my story, you know, when I'm present in the boardroom wearing a hat, wearing sneakers, and I can still articulate myself at the level of the most educated person in the room, when I go through my resume and people realize that I don't look like the person that they just mm -hmm. read about, that's for all those kids who are standing in Chicago, standing in the inner city of any part of this world, feeling like people have automatically assumed they're not worthy of opportunity because of how they look or what they don't have. It's unfortunate because people are given the benefit of the doubt if they come from an affluent black background, which is unfortunate. Mm. You should have to look at a person and say they're well-dressed, they're well-educated, therefore they're just a better person. Mm. We've associated, you know, we've associated to an extent, we've associated accomplishment with appearance, yeah. right? Yeah. Accomplishment yeah. with education. But unfortunately that's not always the full tale. So what I try to do is I don't want to have the same story a black kid from the hood made it out. No, yeah. my yeah. story is, 
is black kid beat institutional racism black kid beat policies that were just that were completely designed to take an intelligent child like me and put me on Ritalin in the second grade yeah. which is what they tried to do right a black kid that came out of chicago a city that is specifically designed to be segregated so we can't see positive outcomes for ourselves so i didn't beat the odds i beat the system absolutely think, you know, so that's why i tell my story because i don't want people to think this is that i'm a unicorn i'm not man it's plenty of me we yeah. just some of us don't feel as comfortable talking about it because we don't want to compromise our situations but for me if a person doesn't want to do business with me because I speak my truth, that's not a person I need to be in contact you, with anyway. Do you think by saying compromise your situation that you mean vulnerability? Do, do no, you, I mean, people are afraid to tell their truth because they don't want to lose a paycheck or a job. Yeah. You know? they, yeah. They, they value that more than they value their, their own, I guess, uh, integrity in, and yeah. in their own ethics. Because I don't care if you're white, black, Asian, Latino, whatever, every person deserves to be their full self and accepted for who they are. Absolutely. And when you play the role of being half of who you are, you rob the world of this God-given gift that you can put on full display because you're more afraid of what a man thinks about mm. you than what you think about yourself. Mm. And so I practice love. I, I accept who I am, and I don't expect anyone else to validate my existence because I have my wife, my kids, and then the God I pray to that tells me that my life is just as valuable as anyone else's. And any person that has that has come in contact with me knows that I'm a servant first before I'm a before a leader. And I don't feel sorry for myself. I don't have any <laughs> excuses except for it. it didn't happen because I didn't make it happen. No one puts any limits on me. I was watching that interview. I was watching that interview you did with Tom and uh, <laughs> he was, you know, you were talking and he he's like, Jason, your words are. I really think you should be a rapper. And you were saying things like introspection and duality and illustrious and all these different things. And it's it's it was kind of interesting because I took his statement. Well, I actually wanted to ask you how you took a statement, because I know in like you're talking about Illmatic. I know you're like, there's nothing better, man, than putting on the Illmatic album and going to work. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's interesting because it is one of my questions that I have that is further down. But we call it the uniform mentality. And the biggest thing mm -hmm. that even when I seen you, I'm like, okay, even myself, I'm like, man, I know Jason. He's, you seem like you like your hats. You like all these things. I spend probably 50% of my day in a suit and tie. Now it's mm -hmm. in where I am. I mean, I own a marketing company and we don't, it's interesting. Like Canada and us is different because when I talk to like, say a black dude or a sister down in the United States, or I talk mm -hmm. to, you know, a black dude or sister here in Canada, it's a little different. Number one, California has more population than Canada. So, yeah. <laughs> so we, we, if you come to Canada, you're probably like, it's empty up here. And I never understood that until I went to the States and I'm like, holy crap, it is busy here. So, yeah. but, but my question is, is that like, you shouldn't be judged on what you wear or how you look, but more so the results that you can put up to the table for you. Mm -hmm. Would you say the way you dress and your whole personal brand is very, very deliberate or it's just who you are. However, you did mention, I, I do go into the boardroom looking like this because I want other people in Chicago or everybody in the corner who's feeling a little bit like oppressed, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. look at me and be able to relate. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's naturally who I am. And then I've just turned it into an intentional expression of who I hope people see when they see people that look like me. So it's, it serves a double purpose. One is the skin that I'm comfortable in. And, you know, I look at like I, they pray. This is what I always tell people. And this is no shots at Mark Zuckerberg. I think what he's built is amazing. But they romanticize the fact that he wore a hoodie. They mm. romanticize the fact that he ate ramen noodles. That's not that's not that's not sexy or attractive. Like, bro, we grew up with nothing. Ramen noodles well, what we ate because that's what we could afford. It wasn't mm. a sign of my ability to be a scrappy entrepreneur. It wasn't mm. a prerequisite for mm. success. It's like, oh, you ate ramens? You wear the same outfit? Man, you should be a tech founder. But we've taken these things that people are literally shamed for, romanticized it, and made it seem like it's this whimsical tale of this kid who came from nothing. Who No, Mark Zuckerberg came from a wealthy family. Mm -hmm. Mark Zuckerberg mm. dropped out of Harvard, <laughs> a really prestigious school. Like He, <laughs> he, he was going to be okay regardless. Yeah. What he did do is he was persistent and he created something from nothing. I respect that. But by no stretch of the imagination can we assume that Mark Zuckerberg's life, from a financial perspective, would have been anything but okay. He was mm. already okay. Mm. So the reason I dress this way is because when I wear this uniform in my skin, it's looked at as, you can people say, oh, I'm less educated. Mm -hmm. He's a thug. 
he doesn't have a proper pedigree, he's not worthy of my time or attention. Or you look at Zuckerberg, he's wearing a sweater, he's disheveled, he looks like he hasn't slept for three days, he <laughs> must be a, he's a hacker, he's really going after yeah. it. So all is I'm using... I'm using, see, the thing about how I was raised with my dad being former military and, and having us think very tactically, as I always talk about, is there's, there's two ways to look at a fight. If you fight the fight itself, you start to exert too much energy in the wrong place and you eventually succumb to the fight, meaning that the weight of the fight itself is keeping you held down. You're on your back. This is the illustration. You're on your back. Somebody's trying to keep you on your back. Mm. You're fighting to get up. Mm. Whereas you go with the flow of the fight you let the person lean their way into you, they're going to get tired. You can start to see ways to break that hole. You can start to put up the proper guard. You can, pro- you can start to slip out of that hole because you're going with the flow of the fight. Mm. What I do in the way I dress is I go with the flow of the stereotype. They assume that I don't know much. <laughs> they assume that mm. I don't have anything to contribute. And therefore, by assuming, they automatically give me the upper hand in the conversation because I know everything about what they're thinking. They know nothing about what I think, I'm mm. thinking. They, they've already given up on trying to figure me out. So this is social camouflage. I can hide in plain sight. I'm mm. the most educated person in most rooms that I'm in. But because I'm dressed this way, I'm the person that people expect the least from. So I get to see who people are before they know my resume. Mm. And that tells more about them than it says about me. Because if you treat me well when I'm wearing an all blacks jersey and a, and, a, and a cap and some sneakers, and you treat me like a human, and then you realize that I'm the person that you're trying to pitch your business to. I'm the person that you're trying to mm. meet. I'm random dude in the lobby. Because that's a lot of times when people come and see me that have never saw me or met me. I sit in the lobby and I strike up a conversation with them prior to them checking in. Uh. And, and, I, I, and, they, and sometimes <laughs> people treat me like trash. And then they say, oh, um, and then the front desk person to be like, oh, Jason, your meeting's here. I'm like, thank you. Yeah, we just met. And they're like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm like, nah, dude, you're not sorry. You're sorry that you actually didn't have the chance to put up your front. But what you just did to me is a reflection of who you are. We don't need to have a meeting. So the thing is, is, man, we try to fight and combat stereotypes. No, no, don't. Don't waste your time doing that. Let people expect less from you. Let people expect that you're not going to do something. Because you know why? You have the upper hand because when you do it and you do it well, now you figured out a way to be your full self on purpose in front of people that can encourage others. Mm -hmm. So I'm sit here and try to convince people because I wear a hat and sneakers that they should love and respect me. I love and respect me. My wife and kids love and respect me. My community loves and respect me. All I'm trying to do is say, yes, think less of me because that means I can maneuver without any friction because you're not worried about me. The moment that I I start to dress and I start to model their behavior, then they have to worry about me because they see me as a competitor. What's, what's, what's better? The competitor you don't know you have or the one that you know you have. Like if they don't know I'm competition, they're not going to put up much of a fight. So, so I'm assuming your bedtime book was Sun Tzu Art of War at some point, meaning, uh, you know, make noise in the, uh, you know, in the East and come back around from the West. Like you're very, you're very tactful with your words. You're very tactful with, with your demeanor. And I mean, I, I, I kind of view you, I've never met you in person, but to me, you, you mm-hmm. seem like you could be very disarming, meaning just, you know, you're a regular dude. You're, 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 you definitely got two ears and one mouth. So you're listening double. Um, mm-hmm. it's interesting too. Cause when you talk to people, you can always tell when you're having a conversation with somebody and they're listening just to like talk, meaning they're not mm-hmm. really listening to you. And I think that there's some, uh, some value in, uh, in listening. You did mention a statement. I like, I wish I wonder. Um, mm-hmm. and this was in one of your past interviews. I thought it was, I don't know. It's kind of a, I don't know. I, it, I just like the statement because I felt that, you know, you did say this again, right? You could, you know, if you can't explain it to an eight year old or an 88 year old, right. Uh, you don't know the subject well enough. Could you explain to the listeners? I like, I wish I wonder. Yeah. So it's not something I, I could take credit for. It's, it's language that, uh, actually was created at Stanford by a linguist, um, who worked on a specific area of conflict resolution for team management. Yeah. And so while I was teaching at the D school and, and, and working and researching there, um, I took the framework and adopted it to my own personal kind of usage in terms of career development and personal development. Uh, while I do so very introspective, self-reflective exercises. And it's, I like, um, I, so if we put it in context, right, let's say I'm designing a product, I'll make it up a car. I design the car, it goes out into the market, and then I'm asked, okay, to improve that project. And then what I would do with myself is I'll start with saying, this is what I liked about it. 
So it, I, it, it psychologically and emotionally anchors me in a positive mindset. It's about mm. growth mm. because what we've been conditioned to do is use fixed language instead of growth language. Mm. Man, I wish I did a better job. That's fixed. That means that you can't control the outcome because you failed previously. Mm. When you switch it psychologically and emotionally and, co- and cognitively, you start off by what I like. You use growth language. It opens your mind up to what's next. It's possibilities, which mm. is a, it's a framework that comes from positive psychology. If you haven't researched positive psychology, check it out. It's really, really cool. Mm. Um, so you start with the positive, which we often hear, but it's been proven that it works. Then I wish is is, is, is a way of reframing the thing that you did wrong. It's saying, I like that I did this. I wish that I would have took more time on, let's say, the, the seat design because because I felt like the seat design was unresolved. I, mm-hmm. I did what I could do, but I ran out of time. And I wonder next time, if I was to redo this car or start the second vehicle, how would I go about including more people, get better resources, be more focused on strategic outcomes so I don't run out of time? Mm-hmm. So what it does is it takes a self-critique, it takes a project critique, and it makes it less about where you failed, more about how you can learn from those failings and use it to do a better job next time. So it's just a, it's just a hack. It's a quick ling- linguistics hack that allows you to stay in a growth mindset because specifically for people of color or anyone who feels oppressed, because it's not often just the skin tone. It could be your gender. It could be your religion. Um, we are conditioned to constantly be in a fixed mindset. Mm. You know, when you hear the word if, if is a fixed principle. Like for me in my life, while I'm a big fan of positive psychology, I used to hear all the time, if you make it to 16, uh. if you make it out of Chicago, if you get a degree, but you go to these more affluent communities, it's when you go to college, when you get a job, right? And so uh, these kids are get, they're given a growth mindset. They have a definitive outcome that leads to success. We have a fixed outcome, which mm, leads to failure. And yeah. just with language. So I'm very particular about words because words are things that you carry in your spirit. And if you don't say the right things, the words are seeds that are planted specifically in children. And that's the voice they'll hear in their head when they become adults. So I try to plant seeds of hope and aspiration and joy and growth instead of seeds of destruction and, and self-hatred because it leads to that when you see and extrapolate those words out into how people evolve, you know, in their careers or in their lives. Do you enjoy coming from where you came from on the journey to where you are now or do you enjoy where you are now more or do you ever pick or is that even a fair question? Meaning, you know, the way you start out, the journey to get to where you are. Because I noticed everyone who, you know, it's funny because I, I, I really, I looked, I, I watched it. Well, whatever was online, I watched. And I, I, I looked at a lot of the questions that a lot of the interview people asked. And they, of course, they talked about Nike and the Air Jordan. And I know you, you know, 100 sketches you took, you know, mom took you, you said, I, I got to do this. But I just oh. think from you on a humanity perspective, what means the most to you out of the different phases of your life? And is there any one that just you say, Ryan, man, like this, this was the, the phase that just set it off for me. Um, I think that phase is right now. Yeah. You know, I think you, <laughs> to be honest yeah. with you, I, th- yeah. I think the best, the best life, the best life you're living is the one you have right now. Um, because it's the only thing that I can actually, actually be present in. I can't be present in the past. I can't be present in the future, but I can be present today. So I try to live my best exact life, um, right now. And the reason I say, you know, not just, you know, metaphorically, but literally it is, man, because for the first time, somebody like me who has ADD, who's a polymath, because I, I have various interests and I've mastered various disciplines because of my interest and curiosity. It's hard for me to find a place where I can be my full self to really settle in and to feel comfortable being a nerd, a street dude, yeah. an athlete, a graffiti artist. Like you, I'm always you have to pick. You can't be cool, smart, nerdy. You can't be all all the time. Like people want you to be in a bucket because that's what they expect you to be. And for me, being a super heroic and having this team of people around me and a community that supports me and allows me to, to be my full self and say, Jason, be that comic book dude that's a nerd. Be the, the, the dad who likes to hang out with his kids. Be the community activist that you want to be. Be the lecturer and the teacher. And all of that contributes to the success of our company. It's a blessing. Because, you know, being within the structure of Nike, I had to do and be who Nike needed me to be for them to make a profit off my talent. Yeah. Being in, being in academics, I had to do and be what they needed me to do to learn and to grow and to teach. But being in my own company, I don't have to put a limit on myself. I don't have to put restraints on myself. I get to be as expansive and as focused at the same time as I physically want to be. And it's very helpful to my spirit. It's very helpful to my children because... You know, the one thing I believe is that I'm born to be 
an intellectual sprinter, which means I can process information fast. I can move fast. But I've often been in environments where I'm with people who are distance runners. Mm. Where they're like, Jason, you know, this is a marathon, not a sprint. I'm like, mm. uh, technically it is a sprint because you don't have tomorrow. Mm. You got to get it all in today. Mm. Life, mm-hmm. life is a sprint. I got 24 hours to make the most out of. I don't have 24 years. I can't. I'm not that arrogant to believe I can predict that I'm going to live for a long time. So I think having been surrounded by people who think life's a marathon, take your time. You know, <laughs> yeah. That's like, bro, you don't come from where I come from. Yeah. Man. People are dead before they're born. Interesting. Because, you know, it's it's I always say to people, I'm like, man, if you if, if fear sets in or whatever dream you're pursuing, we all have a shelf life. And I mean, I the ones the biggest sobering thought that I have is, mm-hmm. Ryan, you're going to die one day. Oh, man. When I oh, <laughs> oh, it's it, 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 it ask my wife and my family like when and you're right. Like when people give me the conversation of, well, Ryan, you know, we could do that next week or how come we can't wait two weeks? I just. I'm like, you are, you know what, honestly, it is. I, I, I think they're like, it's like an egotistical asshole. I think that's mm-hmm. so arrogant to say we have this much time because the reality is we don't, we don't know what time we have, right? Even me speaking to you, and it's funny because I, 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 I use this as an example already. I emailed through your website. I'm like, I got to get this guy on. I got to talk to Jason. And I'm like, okay, that's it, man. Forcing functions all the way, right? And then I sent the first email and I think it's your PR and then they CC'd me, but I think they meant to BCC me. So they basically send the email. Yeah, it's just another podcast. I'm like, oh, snap. So I thought about this for like five days and I'm like, oh, hell no, they didn't. They, they played gatekeeper on me. And then I'm like, that's it. Jeez, man, we are, we're in a social world. This guy's got Instagram and I went to everything, man. And I'm like, okay, and I messaged you. And then I literally slipped into one of your posts. And I commented on your post. I'm like, dude, you know what? Like, and I hashtagged it and then you got back, right? But, you know, because I, I respect people's time and I know that, hey, man, you're a busy guy. But mm-hmm. I, all in all, I mean, what do you say to somebody that says, you know, this educational thing here in Canada, we're having a big, big, big debate about it because a lot mm-hmm. of kids, if we go, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 years back, especially coming from, you know, I want to say cultured families. So if you're Asian, black, East Indian, Arabic, uh, especially mm-hmm. if you immigrated over, um, the way out was always seen as going to school, getting a great education and parents would often push that. What what that led to, though, was a lot of people are doing careers that they absolutely hate. And mm-hmm. that could be everything from being a lawyer, being a doctor, no curriculum. You know, for me, I'm an entrepreneur through and through. But 15 years ago, I mean, I didn't there was no there's nothing that said entrepreneur. And I don't even know what that looks like. The only consistent thing, you know, in entrepreneurship is change. Now, mm-hmm. when I speak at schools and I go and speak to like a lot of like African cultural societies and, and things like that, they say, you know, Ryan, come and speak to the youth. Um, and a lot of kids say, Ryan, do you have to go to post-secondary to be successful? And they'll just straight up ask it like that. And I say, mm-hmm. my answer and my belief is no. However, mm-hmm. do you have to be educated? Yes. And then they kind of mm-hmm. say, well, what do you mean by that? And I'm like, well, you don't technically have to go to like an Ivy League formal school to get educated. We do have something called Google and YouTube and the Internet. Mm-hmm. Um, and I and I call it this industrialized way of thinking where we were taught, you know, and I know it's a little different in the States, but in Canada, kindergarten mm-hmm. all the way to grade 12, get really good marks in grade 12 because that's going to determine your future first year university. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Do you think that and I know for you because you're so passionate about education, your half your bio is is educational and then your other half is complete contradiction in the sense of. Man, you're just like, yo, dude, school of hard knocks, get it done. So Jason's mm-hmm. in academia and then you're just like, uh, yo, dude, just get it done. How mm-hmm. do you do that? Can you teach somebody that? And what's mm-hmm. your whole opinion on that? Mm-hmm. I mean, first of all, man, it's a great, that's a great question. Um, I appreciate the thoughtfulness in that question because I think that people, to your point, have framed the education conversation quite, quite wrong. Um, so what ended up happening is just a quick timeline because we have the same kind of industrial education here and it's all based on the schedule of farming. That's why we have yeah. summer break because yeah. kids work, work on farms. That's the only reason. It has <laughs> nothing to do with, you know, with figuring out that that's the best time to give kids rest. Or yeah, yeah, no, yeah, it yeah. came down to putting kids to work on a family farm. So we, we, count, we used to have a society where the most famous people were Nobel laureates. They were poets. They were academics. They were people that were taking knowledge. And they would apply it to something, right? 
when we moved away from praising our smartest people and there was a brain drain in academia that went into financial services, which essentially was Wall Street, which is the, the kind of godfather of entrepreneurship mm. and the kind of, you know, distant cousins of Silicon Valley. Right. Mm. Um, what switched is that we stopped praising the application of knowledge and only praising the acquisition of knowledge. And we kept saying, go to school, do this, do that, go take this test. Go, da, 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 da. Mm. And it became about metrics instead of outcomes, yeah. numbers instead of meaning. Yeah. And we have a generation of kids who are all tricked into believing that, yo, if I get this degree, go to the school, my life's going to be straight. And the world is not that clean cut and simple. Like, yes, there is knowledge acquisition, but what's more important is knowledge application, which is the difference between education and knowledge the way you describe it. Mm. We have a whole bunch of educated idiots. You know what I'm saying? Everybody, <laughs> which is yeah, because they have experience, right? Yeah. Like education without experience is useless. Yeah, it's useless. That's like I used to have these debates with people because I'm a big fan of critical discourse and debate and rhetoric. I think it's yeah. healthy and it needs to happen more. But I used to debate with people in Portland who would argue with me about places they've never actually traveled to. Yeah, and they were so upset about what was happening in China. They're so upset about what's happening in Western Africa. And I'm like, well, yo, when did you go? Oh, I haven't, but I read about it. I'm like, well, how is an expert in something you've never seen? Yeah. So that's the big piece, right? We keep praising armchair experts, and everybody has an opinion about stuff they never did. So for me, the reason why I purposefully stay in between the grind and the academic world is for a very specific reason. Research studies do not include enough people of color. Research mm. studies do not include enough women. Mm. So people are researching what things will affect all of us. They're looking at a very specific group of mm. test subjects, particularly white men. Mm. Nothing wrong with that, but it gets really tricky when you think about medical treatment. You think about policies that are impacting society. You think about schools and pedagogies that our children are learning. When you're only talking to a specific demographic of people and researchers are only amidst people who look like them, they're not consciously thinking about the diversity that needs to be accounted for in research. So by me being in academia, I can sit with the PhDs who are going out and researching the future of childhood education and remind them, yo, 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 yo. <laughs> Most kids of color are kinesthetic learners. They move when they learn. There's nothing wrong with them. Kids mm. of color have kinesthetic. They don't sit still. That's not our, that's not a cultural norm for us. For mm. me to be black, sitting still is like, what? No, get up, move, dance, be expressive. That's our culture. But they take these academic studies and they say, oh, any kid who can't sit still for this period of time must have ADHD. Let's put him or her on Ritalin. Jason, what's so what's since, your what's your roots? Like it was interesting. I had a conversation. Sorry to interject. But I'm, I'm, um, I asked I was talking to this one dude in the airport. I think it was like in Los Angeles. And <laughs> mm-hmm. I, felt, I felt stupid after the conversation, but it was really yes. enlightening. Which, which probably was a good conversation, but because uh, I always say if I don't kind of feel a little stupid after a conversation, I didn't really learn much. But anyway, um, yeah. it, he I said to him, I said, what's your background? He's a black dude. He's like, I'm African-American. I'm like, OK, I'm like, but you're like, what's your roots? He's like, oh, I'm African-American. And I now here in Canada, when you ask a black person that, like, for instance, my dad's Jamaican. So I would say, you know, I'm mm-hmm. Caribbean. It, you know, it's not mm-hmm. like like we don't really call like Jamaican Canadians or African Canadians. Like we don't have mm-hmm. that, you know, simile here. Right. But for you, like, is it straight up African-American or is it going back or like how 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 far back do you go in, in that? Uh, uh, for me, I'd say I'm black. I don't believe in a hyphen. I'm yeah, not yeah. half a man. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm black, you know what I'm saying? Uh, but I know as, from an ancestral ethnic standpoint, uh, my mother's father um, is Israeli. My mother's mother is black. Um, my father's family is mixed between Native American and, uh, and and Irish and Greek. Yeah, yeah. So we're very diverse. And so we know because of my family's passion for acting, my, my whole family are civil rights activists, pastors, and educators. Yeah. And so knowing who we are is a big part of our family. It's what we constantly talk about. It's why I have, as you mentioned, kind of like the type of demeanor that I have because I've never grew up void of knowing who I was. Yeah. Like I always knew who I was. My parents taught me it was enforced in our home. We knew knowledge itself. My middle name is Carter. I named after, you know, my grandfather, but also by Carter G. Woodson, the, the forefather of, you know, at Black History Month. So it's embedded in my DNA to know that I'm not a slave. I'm not, yeah. my history doesn't start 400 years ago. Now, like, kind of, I know that. Now, kind of going into the environment, uh, I was watching mm-hmm. a small little interview with Warren Buffett. He, I find him a really interesting dude. Um, and 
the lady asked him, they were, he was kind of going through his, I think his hometown, Omaha, Nebraska or whatever. And he was kind of like mm-hmm. taking the lady through and just saying, you know, this is the McDonald's that I eat. I didn't know that most days he eats McDonald's twice a day either. Like it was just, he's a simple dude. Um, mm-hmm. But anyways, after they're sitting down, you know, they always ask the question like, you know, what would you give for tips for success or how did you get to where you are? And he said, you know, she basically said, did luck play a role? And he said, mm. well, to some degree, you know, luck played a role. And then he said, but the biggest the biggest item for me that played the hugest role was the womb in which I was born. And Mm -hmm. she was like, what? And he's like, I was born when I was born. If I would have been born female or black, he's like, Mm -hmm. I would not, I would not have been in the position I was in today. And what he actually said, what he actually said was this and was interesting is he said, let's put it this way for, uh, for a black dude to get to where I was right now, where I am right now, he would have had to probably put in about 10 times the effort, so to speak. And she was like, she didn't even know where to go with the interview after that. <laughs> Cause he was just so blatant about it. And even me, I was yeah. like, damn, like, you, so I guess the question is, is can somebody, okay, I'm so side Chicago. When somebody says to you, Jason, I'm a product of my environment. How can I manipulate my environment or my certain circumstances to get out and get to where I want to go? A, can it be done or B, is that a fair question? Like, can it be done? Mm-hmm. Or does it take some crazy perseverance? Or in some aspects, are you a little screwed? Mm-hmm. No, nah, I mean, to, to, you know, I'll start with the last point. To assume that you're screwed, at least in what I believe, is, is to basically say that what God has placed in front of your life is so insurmountable that you're pretty much destined to just fail. Yeah. None of us are born to fail. We accept failure. Failure is a choice. Yeah. It is an absolute choice. And using the excuse of being born in the inner city, um, I actually think it's better to be born in, in rough conditions, to be honest, because mm. at least it's visible, it's visible what you need to get past. Like mm. I have a, visi- a visible opposition. It's the inner city. Mm. I spend a lot of time with kids who are born into affluent communities who have everything. Their obstacle is mental. They can't see the thing that they need to get around, but mm. they feel it. Mm. So I actually believe that we're at an advantage to have to go through tough conditions because conditions can change just by me being able to leave that environment. Mm. But the way I think, though, that's something that's hard. Like if my inner voice is telling me like, oh, I'll never be like my mom and dad. They're so smart. They're so successful. Or my whole life I heard, oh, you're awesome. You're amazing. Everything is perfect for you. And then you, you know, you show up and meet that kid who's going to outwork you and you, you're crushed. The first time. <laughs> like, that you're not the best. You just had a bunch of people around you let you feel like you're the best. I honestly think that if a person is saying, how do I get out of the inner city? The best way is to is to let your mind wander through literature, man. Like stop watching videos and read. Mm. That's the beautiful thing about reading is your brain gets to create the image. And that mm. image was so beautiful is it feels a curiosity that gets you to get up and want to leave and see if it's real. Mm. When we, cause now with the internet, we can see everything. So we're desensitized. We're like, oh yeah, you know, I, I saw it. I've been to China cause I watched the video. Mm. But when we have to read about China, you were like, man, I wonder what this looks like. I need to go. Mm. Um, so I say for people who are in the, in the city, you know, the internet might not be there, but yo, libraries still exist. Mm. Re- travel with your mind because mm. that's the part that you should never be impoverished is how you think. You, you may know, have the work clothes, yeah. the work, but your your mindset, man, needs to be a mindset of, of wealth. You know what? I, uh, I, I think one of the most powerful things and one thing that I live by is the power of visualization. Um, mm-hmm. I come from a big football background, love football. Um, and you know, playing sports, sports, what you learn in sports obviously transfers into, I think it transfers mm-hmm. into anything in life. Um, mm-hmm. and visualization to me is, is huge because I feel like there's not many things I've done in life that I couldn't see myself doing prior because for mm-hmm. me to do anything, I feel like there's a certain amount of steps that has to be taken and there's a certain amount mm-hmm. of preparation that has to be given into it. Even mm-hmm. a, a situation like this. And it's funny. It's, I watch you on Tom's interview and I didn't hear of you before that. And then I'm like, okay, man. 
And when you started talking, dude, it was just, yeah, you're right. The word illustrious, right? Like, I'm just like, yeah. whoa, this guy's making love to vocabulary. <laughs> like, what the, what the hell's going on with this? Like, where's the thesaurus at? Webster needs to be rechanged to maiden or something. But anyways, and I'm like, okay. And, you know, I, then I just go into, and my wife laughs all the time because I'm, it's at 1 a.m. in the morning. I, I wake mm-hmm. up, this damn phone, right? Because this is a remote control of our life. And it's, you know, mm-hmm. instant access. And I just start, you know, watching everything. And I'm like, I'm visualizing myself talking to this guy. That's it. And the moment I could visualize it, I'm like, what steps have to be taken? And I don't care about the work and persistence it takes. That to me is never, never an issue. I'm willing to always do that. But it's the step. So kids out there, I mean, for you specifically, especially going back to your early days, do you think the way you are, like you mentioned ADD, you mentioned, you know, certain things like maybe they're, you know, trying to push me in one lane. I don't want to, you know, subscribe to that lane and et cetera, et cetera. Was the way you are cultivated on hunger, necessity, or just survival? Man, I would say all three, to be honest with you. Uh, you know, the people that I looked up to weren't real people. I mean, I looked up to comic book characters. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know, um, because they were the closest example of people I felt, you know, had the skill set and the relative drive that I wanted to, you know, align myself with. And I had tangible heroes, you know, Michael Jordan being most mm. notable and being able to work for him was great. But but Michael only got me to a certain extent that that Michael was the physical embodiment of excellence. You know what he did athletically. I wanted to I wanted to be like Lucius Fox, man. Mm. When this man was. The, the intellectual, you know, um, Lucius Fox. example of, of what we can be. Right. And so that's been my dream my whole life is to be like Lucius Fox, to be the guy who designs the gear for the Batmans in the world. So in order to become something that you've never seen, um, it takes a lot of hunger and a lot of stubbornness. That's the part people don't, it's not about, you know, people say, Oh, you gotta be tough and resilient and persistent. The word that really describes all of that is being stubborn. Mm. Mm. You can't allow yourself to ever, ever let anybody tell you no mm. and when people say oh you can't do that because you know i can't do it then you just have to look and say well that's your limit that's not my limit mm. what mm. you can do has no bearing on what i can do because you know people people have a great way of placing their insecurities on others mm. because since they didn't accomplish it how can you accomplish it that's our own ego that we all carry like oh well they can't do it because i couldn't do it but i just put that back on them i don't let anybody else place their insecurities on me i say no nah, that's what's up that's 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 where you were limited maybe that's where i begin so maybe this is meant for me to do it have you read um, that book have you read that book called ego's the enemy by ryan holiday Mm-mm. Oh, that sounds like I should read though. Read that book, "Ego Is the Enemy" by Ryan Holiday, and it just—it's basically what you're saying. It, but I mean, he—he he breaks down like you're talking about the mind. You're talking about you know the 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 positive psychology. You're talking about the linguistics. He just—it's kind of a book that after you read it, you feel like you're you're left sitting there naked. <laughs> just <laughs> just you're just like, what was that, and how did that even go down? So it's a it's a r- fantastic book. Um, you mentioned you looking up. Up to people like Michael Jordan and obviously getting to work for that work for him there must be a massive amount of visualization that even needs to happen to be able to achieve that however in today's world Snapchat Instagram Facebook the monstrosity of social media when you ask a lot of young young kids who they're looking up to you're getting names of like YouTube stars you're getting you know so what do you think of that yeah like what do you think of that I know you got an opinion about that Oh man! Like, you know, like, where does where does a kid now find their Lucius Fox? Like, how or, or do they even find the Lucius Fox? You know that, and that's that's honestly that's scary. That's what it's scary, and that's and that's why I'm focused on elementary school kids. You know, with my company, <laughs> yeah. To be honest, with you, because we've democratized greatness to an extent where it's almost buffoonery. It's yeah, buffoonery. I mean, it's it's we've scaled mediocrity to make yeah. that the norm. Yeah. So therefore, anything above completely whack is accepted. Like, yo, oh, they not whack. Oh, good. Yo, cool. It's dope. Like half the music that's made is incoherent. Is I mean, no knock on it, but it's like, bro, when half the words you say aren't words, they're sounds that you make when you're hungry or you sleeping and talking to yourself in your dream. And you put that over a beat and you get a Grammy for that. We've now gotten to a place. <laughs> where it's so accepted to be average that anything above average, slightly above average, is looked at as excellent. So I think the social media culture has given all of us a platform, has given people a place to display their talents and say what they're going to say. But we've also encouraged the most bombastic, most 
belligerent personalities to just do these crazy stunts to constantly get attention. Mm. So it's less about quality. It's more about quick attention. Mm. And it's fearful because that doesn't build reputation. That doesn't build sustainability. It builds instantaneous momentary fame. Mm. And it's fleet because one day you're a mean, the next thing you're nothing. Like the catch me outside girl. Right. <laughs> Where's yeah. she at now? Yeah. Where's she at? Like for she yeah. got a record. She gave yeah. a million dollars. She she ain't put no album out. Yeah. She's sitting around. Yeah, you know, yeah. Or, or you know, all the memes and all these viral things. These people are famous for two seconds and they go away back to their regular lives. And we're setting those people up for failure because they expected to be treated a certain way, you know, um, you know, and accepted. But it was never the system isn't designed for that. Mm. It, it's designed to exploit you for a moment for our entertainment, then put you back where you came from. Mm. Do you, you ever know, so do, do you ever doubt yourself? Like, do you ever do you ever feel? I mean, Never. Uh, you know, oh God, see, oh my God. Okay, you gotta explain that to me. Okay, so you ne- you never like like how how is this possible? It's it's a it's yeah. such a simple question, but I mean, oh yeah. man, the listeners off this one question that right now they're being like, fuck that, like that's bullshit, right? Like th- that's that's impossible. But I know, uh, like, explain it. No, nah, man. I mean, listen. Here's the deal. Anybody that, you know, I'm pretty much the same person, whether I'm interviewing or I'm, you catch me at a Starbucks. I don't doubt myself for two specific reasons. One, I wasn't born on accident. I don't care if my parents planned me or didn't plan me. I was meant to be here. Something brought me here. Therefore, I have a purpose to be here. So that's that's one. When you know you have a purpose, why doubt yourself? Because any road you take will get you to your purpose if you're willing to continuously stay in motion. Mm. Two, I don't accept excuses. I don't allow myself to think negatively. I speak to myself so much out loud. I encourage myself because if I don't believe, nobody else is going to believe. So if I start doubting, then I see my children doubt, my wife doubt, my company doubt. Ooh. I don't have room for doubt. Mm. Me being a black educated male that hasn't been in jail, that has two kids that are healthy, I don't have a bunch of family. I've already beat the odds. I've already proven that I'm nothing that they say we are. Mm. All I need to do is continue to be myself and that in and of itself is success. So to have doubt, is to worry about what people think about you. To have doubt is to is to try to perform for an audience that's not the audience that really, truly you should be trying to impress. And I'm performing for an audience of one. And that's who I pray to. That's who I believe in. Mm. I don't, I'm not living for acceptance of men because I'm temporary. So why worry about something that's not permanent? Mm. Everybody, like you said earlier, is going to die and go where they go, wherever you believe in. So why should I worry about the opinions of people who are just as temporary as I am? Mm. That makes zero sense. Like now, I can see if this is, if there was a permanent fixture that I'm worrying about, and yeah, but these are temporary people, temporary moments, things change, and so I don't I don't doubt myself. That's just too much of a too how much do, of a waste. How, of do, time. how do you find comfort in being misunderstood? Because somebody like you, when you talk to the average person, first of mm-hmm. all, I I would I would I would attest that the average person is going to be what the hell just happened or what's going on or like because everything that you say is so against what a lot what is kind of you know mainstream quote unquote so how do you find comfort in being misunderstood maybe that's not the mm-hmm. right word but i i i will use the word I'll, I'll i'll give credit to mr jeff bezos on the word misunderstood because when when they did ask him about the whole amazon thing he basically said you know if anybody's remotely trying to do anything different in this world they better be really really comfy and cozy with being misunderstood and then they really should not give a shit yeah, hundred percent. No, you know, so how I frame being misunderstood is with a simple explanation. It's called vision because only certain people can see it. Mm. You know mm, what I'm saying? Yeah, it's yeah. Called, so the vision I have is intended for me to see it, and others <laughs> won't see it until I do it. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? So, I, so if somebody doesn't understand me, they can't because they don't see my vision, and they won't understand me until I complete the mission I'm here to complete. Mm. And so, to, to Jeff Bezos' point. It, you absolutely, like I said, you have to be stubborn. You can't accept somebody else's vision because they're not inside your brain seeing what you see in the world. Mm. You know, so I'm not worried about being misunderstood. I'm, 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 I'm more. I'm not worried about any of that. I'll be honest with you. What I'm more focused on is, is, is. Do you, is do, being, you do you know why you're not but, though? I figured it out. I've been I've been trying to I've been trying to to, to psychoanalyze, <laughs> mind mess you up, but I, I figured it out because. You're not egotistical because think about the concept. We're, like, follow me on this. Okay, if somebody feels 
like the audacity that you should feel a certain way. It's almost like having a company which you do and then telling your employees, you should be working harder than me. Well, then give them some equity. Give them the same mm-hmm. shit that you're, you know, that you're getting, right? It's mm-hmm. so audacious to expect somebody to think your vision. But for you, it's like you don't have the ego to even think that way. So you're not even in that game. Nah. And I don't think most can say that. No, nah, I don't mean, look, my first, you know, I was on my deathbed at the age of seven. I saw my friend get hurt at 14. I've been in car accidents and taking opportunities away. I've seen so much. I don't have time for it. It takes a very strategic amount of energy to have an ego. You got to keep that act up. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's you so true. Make sure, yeah, because the moment you become an a-hole and you got an ego, people are waiting on you to slip up. They're waiting. Yeah. And you got to consciously be gaming them and playing you know, philosophical, ideological chess all the time. I figured the most honest strategy, the most, the most, you know, effective strategy in today's world, which is full of fallacies and lies, is to just always tell the truth. Okay. Just be honest. Yeah. Be honest about your weakness. Be honest about your fears. Because you know what? People don't believe the truth anymore. So they I, don't. I, I had somebody say something uh, the other day, and basically it was interesting. They had created, um, you know, successful quote unquote. But built up a really good online persona and then feel really frustrated because, as you know, if you build up something in a fake manner, it's it's only a matter of time before it crumbles. I mm-hmm. think they're experiencing the crumble now. But basically, mm-hmm. they said if if Jason was to build up this catalyst and build up this character right now and then basically say, you know, this wasn't me. And I'm not saying that's you, not that's you because mm-hmm. it's not. But how would you go about a getting the proper audience meaning i need the audience for the real jason not this you know made up character of jason would you start over would you blend would you come clean like what would you do and that would be tough like it's a very well introspective in your word thing Mm -hmm. i mean you know to to give advice one i i I can't relate like i'm I'm just always myself but if i if i was Actually, you know what? I do know. I do know a couple of people. I won't. I won't say their names. No, no, that's okay. Um, one person. One person in particular is someone I grew up with. Um, very, 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 very famous. But it's living a double life because of what people <sighs> think this person stands for versus who this person really is. And the difficulty in it all is the way out is to just discuss why you stepped into that role, what you were hoping to get from that role, and then tell people why that role was not effective and it's yep. better for you just to be comfortable in your own skin. Yep. I think a tangible example of that, that we I don't know this woman personally, but Lady Gaga. <laughs> Lady Gaga's transformation back to who she was, I don't think people paid attention to that. She was like, yo, I got into this game singing and playing classical jazz music. Mm. She was a jazz musician. Mm. Lady Gaga's a musician. She mm. plays piano. I mean, she she's amazing. Mm. She became this character. She became this, car, you know, caricature, this cartoon. And she realized, like, man, I was being praised for something I'm not. I just want to go back to being me. Mm. Right. So people are it's not surprising when you think of Lady Gaga and Tony Bennett, when you know who she was before she became Lady Gaga. You know, so th- th- I think that's interesting. That stuff is amazing, I like you know? that, man. You know what? It's interesting. And that's why you see people blowing their you know, they're literally committing suicide and stuff, because. I think I think if fame comes to you and you don't have that foundation that you should, I think that's scary. Tony, have you heard of uh, Amy Winehouse? Oh yeah, absolutely. Right. So, it, oh man, I love her song. I love her. I love her voice. But mm-hmm. you know, obviously, tragic end. But Tony Bennett was interviewed. You mentioned Tony Bennett, and he said, you know, Amy had this voice that, man, I mean, I just don't even know who to compare it to. And he said a quote, and man, this quote, it scintillated me almost as much as the fact that I'm going to die one day. He said, Mm -hmm. when you live life long enough, life teaches you how to live. Mm -hmm. And it's such a deep, it's such a deep quote, you know, because it's kind of funny. Us as humans, we kind of go here, go here, go here. But we only go, we only, like, I don't think life is complicated. I don't. I think life is beautiful and simple. You know, the chances of being born are like, I don't know, seven trillion to one or whatever the hell the numbers are. However... Mm -hmm. We go here, we go there as humans, only to circle back to us. So mm-hmm. it's like if you kind of start out at that from the beginning, I just think that's amazing. You are at a different level because I think that you kind of started out that from the beginning. So as much as you know, you've ran the marathon, you did sprint, um, but you're definitely an old soul. Would you would you say you're an old soul? And would you say you're weird? <laughs> no, I, I, I would say I'm an old soul, and I would say that I'm weird in the context of today. Yeah. You know, if I was if I was alive in the 1920s, 
I would have been part of the Harlem Renaissance and that whole movement. I would have been one of the people who were pushing the advancement of, you know, people that look like me through, through, through art, through music, through poetry. I would have been part of that movement to reinvent and reawaken who we are as people. But in the context of today, I'm absolutely weird Mm. because I, I, I'm comfortable with not being famous. I don't, I don't care if I have a million followers. I just want to do dope work with dope people and leave a legacy of excellence. That's it. Just very simple. And you're, I don't have any you're, other agenda. You're, and you're not an opportunist, eh? Cause like I, I, I look at your social, your social platform and I'm like, if this dude wanted to do some OOTDs or like hashtag, you know, famous with, or man, like you could just by, I mean, ju- you could be a rock star just by association. And I, I find it funny. Cause I look at your Instagram. I'm like, well, he throws up pictures, but um, it's 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 ironic. Like I don't even know how to describe it because I'm like, yo, this dude could get verified probably on Instagram. That's a feat. That's tough to do. I mean, and mm-hmm. but you don't really care about all that. You're you're just dialed into into the craft, mm-hmm. eh? Mm-hmm. I mean, because the moment you start worshiping <laughs> that stuff, it becomes your god. I yeah. don't I don't wor- I don't worship that man. Look, what I put on Instagram is a reflection of what I want to be remembered for. Yeah, my family celebrating my friends. I mean, my timeline is really me. It's, it's a capsule. So when my, I do it for my grandchildren, if Instagram is still a thing, when I have grandchildren, this is a way of them saying like, wow, this is what my grandfather was doing at this moment in time. Look at this. He was with my Mm. dad, my mom, you know, he was, he was serving. He was in a community, man. This is awesome. Mm. This is our way of leaving behind, you know, you know, positive memories to contrast the negativity that's going to be captured in this moment. So when I put stuff on social media, I understand it's going to live somewhere in perpetuity. I just want to make sure that it accurately depicts this this era, this mm. era, and not the negative nonsense that we constantly get served through the mass media. But people, we're media companies now. Individually, we're media companies. Yeah, so, man. So we complain about the news. Then why don't we just create better news through social? Show people the truth. That's the media tool, man. CNN, the NBC, they never had this tool back in the day. No, this is a powerful no. tool. It is. Yeah. It is. For, to, for us to design history while we're still alive. Absolutely. Like, don't think about that. We're living history, bro. Like, that's the part I try to tell people. We're living history. <laughs> so uh, treat it like... It, it, it's, cra- it's crazy to me. Now, it's funny because I, I posted on social. I said, man, I'm going to do an interview with you. So it's funny some of the questions that I got. Some questions were like, you know, kind of like fangirl, fanboy questions. T- Ask him what is ask him what it's like to like meet Michael Jordan, you know, ask those types of questions. I don't care for those types of questions. I want the good stuff. So <laughs> do you think that is there a difference between a famous person and a non-famous person? I know it's a very general question, but in your experience, and I, I want the answer more so from lights camera are off and we're just talking as two dudes, as opposed to like, yo, man, Jason, I gotta go. There's a photo shoot waiting for me. It, it, like, it, is there a difference? Yeah, actually, you know what? It it is. So <laughs> famous, it is. And I explained to you, famous people, um, it depends on what type of fame. So let's just say athletes, for example. Sure. When you're told at the age of thirteen that you're the best ever and you don't have to develop a personality because everything's given to you and people tell you you're great, you become an adult and you get around people that have developed into their full selves. And normally the, the really famous athletes are really intrigued by learning about people who don't do what they do. Mm. It's like, man, what was that like? Oh man. I, Cause remember they, these famous people, yeah. they don't, you don't become famous overnight. It happens over a long period of time and then boom, it just, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Catapults. You know, it, it, it catapults. Right. Yeah. And so that means they've missed out on regular experiences like going to school dances or joining a club or yeah. they probably been forced in being professional when they were children, you know, especially for athletes. So that's the first piece. They don't have the same shared experiences as we do. Their experience is very curated, very specific to their desired outcome, which is being a pro athlete. You know what? The, you know what's so funny about this? I feel sorry for famous athletes. You want to know why? Yeah. Because when you get to that 30, 35, like there's a shelf life on your athleticism. I mean, you get old now, mm-hmm. artistry, not, like even even if we go to the culture now, you have entrepreneurs that have their own shoes. They're like rock stars, mm-hmm. right? It's like this whole startup and angel investing and things like this. So when I look at like the athlete, you're very right because it's like you look at they like some of them struggle with life after sport. And like mm-hmm. Alex, Alex Rodriguez is actually a guy that I think is really cool because, you know, while he was playing baseball, I mean, he he was developing one hell of a businessman. 
you know, mm-hmm. and, and basically said, hey, I, I understand that the whole baseball thing is not going to go forever. And he developed a fantastic business. I, I don't know if mm-hmm. are, do, you, do you know much about him or have you ever looked mm-hmm. into him much? It, 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 it's quite it's quite fascinating, obviously. But um, going back into um, a few questions, I want to kind of get more down to the design. How much more time do I know? I know you're pressed for time a little bit, too. So I'm going to make it quick. Uh, mm-hmm. what, one question I got is. What is the most exhaustive part of the process in creating a top selling sneaker? And I got this question a uh-huh. lot, like, and, and I kind of thought, I'm like, okay, okay, it's general, but is there any one thing where you're like, hmm? Yeah, man. Um, I would say managing the process of of weeding out what opinions matter. <laughs> yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? That's the most exhausting piece. The design part is fun. That's, you know, you love it. You, you're in the grind. You go to your factory. You make something that never existed. That part is really, really fun. And the, and the worry, concern, and stress actually is positive. It's healthy. It's not negative. The most arduous part of the whole process is, is the management of opinions because everybody feels like they have the right to critique something that they can't do. Mm. So that's the thing about being a designer. There's very few of us that can do it but everybody has an opinion about what we do. Mm. Like I can't walk into a mechanical engineer's job and say, yo, bro, hey, that radius, I'm not really feeling that radius, man. That's, mm. two, that's a millimeter off. Or going to you know, a dentist's office and having a, I don't like the way you hold your scalpel. You know mm. what I'm saying? But with design, everybody has an opinion and perspective and everybody thinks that they can do it better if they could draw. That's always the comment. If I could draw, I could do it better than you. It's like, well, Bro, you do know that drawing is 5% of what we do. Like 95% of it is research, insight, taking <laughs> stories, turning it to form, yeah. sourcing, managing a budget. So it's it's that it's 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 really learning how to listen to opinions but only hear what's relevant. Are you a sneakerhead? Nope. I knew I knew it. I knew it. I knew it because I, I, man, it's kind of interesting. I hate that. I, Okay, yeah, I, 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 I know, I know, because I think what makes you tick, how do I say this? Okay, I, a lot of my, 70% of my clients on my marketing are in automotive, so Toyota, Ford. I don't give a shit about cars. I'm obsessed with the process of buying and selling a vehicle, what somebody wants in a car, mental ownership through digital. You know, if you like, if, if I meet a mom and she's got four kids, what do you need from a vehicle? I don't mm-hmm. market, I don't market the actual vehicle, I market the solution to your problem. And then I deliver it in a way that doesn't annoy you and piss you off. And to me, that's good marketing. It's kind of the one you never see, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the sneakerhead culture is so funny because a lot of these guys send me these questions on this. And I, and I, it's like the, the person who actually designs the sneaker that you're reselling for on big money, does he even care about like the, the phrase sneakerhead? And what do you even say to this whole cultural movement And what do you like, what do you think's the future of it? And where did like, just what's your, what's your, what's your, what's your dime on it? Man, listen, look, all of us who helped to kick off this industry and contributed to this industry, you won't hear any of us labeling ourselves as sneakerheads, not purposefully, maybe as a way to relate in a conversation. But honestly, we just love shoes. It's what we love. It's what we've been around. It's what gave us a purpose. It kind of was a, it's like, it was the physical artifact that define our childhood our era mm-hmm. we have emotional attachment to it it's it's different it's like it's, you know what this is it's like you having a smell that reminds you of being around your grandma in jamaica mm-hmm. or whatever right mm-hmm. that, that would mean you you're you're a jamaica head you know it's, it's <laughs> you know what I'm saying? it's a connection to a moment that was so pure that you want to go back to that moment and relive it forever it's that's so- what <laughs> it, it was so funny the other day because we we're having this conversation. My wife and I were having this co- conversation. I think sometimes I, the only friend I have in my in the in the world that I live in is my wife. I keep my circle very small, but um, yeah. it, it, we were talking about the fact is somebody's like, "Well, Ryan, you're half German, half Jamaican." I said, "Okay, let me put it to you this way: If I commit a crime and I run down the block." The cop isn't going to be like, yo, go get that half German. No, man, you a black dude. And so then one guy said to me, because I, I wear suits and stuff, and this is what I didn't like either. It was almost like he expected that I had to look like a hip hop star in order to yeah. be. And I said, listen, I'm black. I don't have to act black. I don't have to go out there and say I'm black. I'm black. Like, I'm, I just yeah. wake up and it's me. I'm, so I, I, so I, I think that's kind of what you're saying, too, right? But sorry, yeah, I mean, sorry to cut you off. Oh, no worries. No, it's exactly that. Because think about it, man. People who, 
and I, 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 the people who talk about the term sneakerhead, they're primarily probably early 20s and below. Mm. That's too dry. They weren't alive when these things first came out. So their emotional attachment to it is not the same. There's no way you can tell me that if you weren't alive when, you know what I'm saying, when when uh, Tim Hardaway was wearing the Air Rays with Spike Lee in the commercial and you knew the moment with the Malcolm X hat in the night and you were there for that, you weren't there for that, that your attachment to that Air Raid as a product that's re-released is the same as mine. Mm. I won't call my, that's my life. I can't, so that's like me being a fan of classical music, but I can't say that I'm a, I, I, I'm a zealot because I wasn't there when Beethoven did it, right? I'm sure the person who was there when he played the music for the first time had a different connection to it. <laughs> so yeah. I'm not knocking sneakerheads. I'm just trying to explain to them that this, you know, the way they go about it, the way they attach themselves to it, the way that they promote it is different than what it means to the people who created it. Mm. They're looking at it as, I just want to wear this to fit in or I can quick mm. sell it. Something you love, you don't sell. Something you love, you hold on to. Something mm. you love, you to share. So it's almost antithetical to the culture, meaning if you love something, you want to share your love with people who also share. That's why I love the sneaker conventions, like the true sneaker mm. conventions. Right? When you go and you see the OGs with the young heads and they trading history and talking mm. about what it was like and you got sketches. and That, to me, is an exchange of love and history and culture. Is there any sneaker I, conferences that you actually like? Is there one, or can you say that, or... Is there one that you uh, kind of like, or you think that is uh, on the more on the authentic side? <laughs> uh, I mean, no, I mean, I, you know, not because they didn't make the other ones feel like sure, sure, sure. Okay, you know, like okay. Finish shots, but okay. but in my experience, the ones that I've been to, the ones where I've had really great exchanges, is when I'm able to sit with a father and a son, mm, and the dad, mm. the dad doesn't get sneaker culture, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. The son is like, wow, man, I want to learn about this, and then the dad is like this is really a thing. And I'm like, yeah, sir, let me explain to you. And then the parents are like, wow, this is really positive. Like I didn't realize so much went into this. Mm. And you see that connection between generations happening. That's the stuff I enjoy when the kid loves it so much, but the parent has no interest in it and thinks it's just about the product. But the kid is like, no, I want to do this for a living. I, I care about this. Mm. You know, it's the people I look up to. Cause you know, to, to a lot of kids, I know I'm an unconventional hero. I'm not a tangible hero. I, you can't just necessarily go and watch ESPN and see me, but I'm on ESPN because of the products I created. Mm. So for my parents, they're, they're trying to wonder, what is so special about these shoes? Why do you want these shoes? And I'm the person that's able to translate why their children love this product to why it's beneficial for them to encourage that love. But then you don't always have people like that. So, What did you feel the first time you seen a, a design that was being worn. I don't even care if it's an athlete. Just the first time you've seen another, your design on some other human's foot. Like, how did you feel? Man, I cried. <laughs> ah, I knew it. See, I was going to ask. Yeah. I was going to ask if you cried. Yeah. I'm a, hey, man. <laughs> no, I, I like man. that. Yeah. I admit it. I, I ain't. Dude, you I, cried, I, eh? Yeah. Like, yeah, like, but, yeah, but, but, but just the emotional, like explain it, like the feeling, well, if you can even crazy. explain it. Yeah. It was, you know, I had, uh, I was, I was 19 years old. I was an intern at Nike. And Jordan brand, Jordan's first intern, Nike's first intern of color, um, specifically black people. Um, mm. And I did a shoe um, called the Air Jordan 17 Mule. It was a slip on. I had this whole concept around, yo, I want to wear Jordans, but I also want casual J's to wear that. I just lounge around a locker room or the crib and I don't feel like having laces. So I mocked it up for myself so I can wear them after I got done hooping because, you know, mm-hmm. athletes wear flip-flops and most athletes toes are messed up so i don't want no open toe, sh- toe shoe because i'm like yo my feet are messed up because i'm playing sports <laughs> uh, you know so so i made the mule people in like jordan brand gentry humphrey and Dwayne edwards who was my boss gentry was in charge of product at the time uh from a product marketing side Dwayne from the design side they both saw him like yo this is crazy can you do some other colors? I did a bunch of colors. And then they were like, yo, we're going to sell this in. They sold it to Foot Locker. So before I left my internship, I had a shoe that got slotted to go to retail. And then they sent me a pair once it was finally done. Tate Kerbis helped to finish it when I left. Mm. Um, they sent me a box of them to wear. And they sent me a note. And then I started to see people around rocking them. And I'm just sitting there thinking, man, like, just, you know, almost to that. It was, it was, I was 19. So just... Five years ago, I saw my friend get shot in the face. Mm. You know, three years ago, I had a teacher tell me that, oh, you won't ever get to art school. Mm. Like, people like you, you don't, people like you, you're not mm. getting into CCS. That school's too hard. You, you, you're not worthy of that school. You're not going there. 
So I'm looking at my life backwards for a period like, wow, yo, all the stuff that people said was stupid and crazy. I got evidence that it's real. And that mm. was the moment I decided to never give any Fs about what people say to me. Mm. Because <laughs> I, I proved to myself that yeah. I can get to where I'm trying to go by just, you know, being prepared and being being aggressive when the moment presents itself. What are so, some, yeah, man, I did try. What are some of the most unknown facts that, uh, you know, about some of the inspiration behind the shoes that you design? Is there anything, I know you've talked a lot about it in some of your other interviews, but is there anything quirky or weird or maybe just not, not really, you know, crazy at all that has went into some of the inspirations behind your design? Um, I mean, you know, man, for Derek Jeter, um, looking at Batman as inspiration. I mean, that dude's a real life Bruce Bruce Wayne, hiding elements from Miss Pac Man in his shoes because he <laughs> loves to play Miss Pac Man. Most people, interesting. Yeah, it, yeah, most people don't even know that. It was more details for him. Um, I did a lot of hidden details, faith elements in Chris Paul's shoes. Uh, Chris Paul's a believer, so there's all these hidden icons and stuff that represent his faith, but you won't know it if you're just an average person looking at it. But he sees it. Um, I mean, I've always I've hidden family initials in shoes, you know, just shout out to my family so they can read it and see like, wow, man, he loves us. That's my own way of celebrating my family. And people don't know the detail unless I point it out. So I've always hidden something in there um, in every product I've done. Oh, I like that, man. That that, that, that sent that sent shivers down my body, actually. I just I just it's it's so cryptic, but I love it. Um, Mm -hmm. You know what? Uh, And I got I got one question for you. Why did you come on? Why did you come on this podcast? And and I, I want this is a real real question. I'm sure you get you get tons of people reaching out. I think you're. I know you use a, a company, but I'm sure you ascertain as to do I want to do this? Do I not want to do this? What's the what's the what's the angle? Everything I know for you, you're probably dealing with people coming at you with all kinds of angles. Why did you come mm-hmm. on the podcast though? And I know I messaged you, but man, as soon as I message you and and I want my listeners to to, to understand this, persistence is everything. Once I felt like I got gatekeeped by Jason's crew, I took a screenshot of the direct message in the Instagram, and I included that on my next email through that damn website. And all of a sudden, I don't know what happened, but magically, oh, we'd love to raise that with you. So I'm like, I, I, you got to tell me, like, what happened? <laughs> I mean, you know, honestly, um, it, it, was, it wasn't nothing magical or anything. It's just, uh, I, you know, the team does an excellent job because of my, you know, I have a double life right now yeah. where I, st- I still do a lot of lecturing. I still go out, talk a lot of conferences. Um, it's, 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 it's getting to the point where it's being well documented that I'm going to go into the political arena someday in the United yeah. States. Yeah. And so the team that I have from a PR perspective, they're very, very strategic on making sure that when people Google me five years from now, that my voice is showing up in the proper places. Mm. That's a big thing because stuff comes up. And that's how people get exposed to something they said five years ago. So I'm like, no, 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 no. Let's start designing what we want to leave in history right now. I I'll, need to design what I, you know, my SEO right now. Yo, man, I think you just paid me the biggest compliment ever. And I'm one of those people like I, I, I'll see the, the everything on everything. That's great. I appreciate that. You're very yeah. right. You're very right about that. So you're very tactful in the design. Now, that is the one. And one of the last questions I have for you is uh, it's Maiden for Mayor in Chicago. <laughs> what 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 is that looking like? Is that is that kind of a possibility for sure? I mean, you know, um, it's a desire. You yeah. know, I can't. It's a desire I have. I can't. I wish I could be the quarterback and receiver of my blessings. I, I'm just the receiver. I just run my route. Um, but you know, it is a desire of mine because I feel like people like myself um, who've had these experiences with entrepreneurship, working in corporate, I, academia. Like we're the exact people that need to go and run for public office because we can relate to the most amount of people, mm-hmm. you know, um, no knock on any politicians. But I believe unless you've experienced being on the receiving end of government assistance, the receiving end of some of these bad policies, it's really hard mm. to have the proper amount of empathy to think about others. When you're uh, come from a family of politicians, you're a lifetime politician, you kind of function that way and you kind of void of the people you're here to serve. So. Um, it's something that I do desire to do. It's something that I'm preparing for. It's something that I think is important. Even just the conversation about it means a lot because it shows people like, yo, we don't have to set our bar low, you know, because I know, you know, Lord willing, let's say I'm able to do it someday. Even if I don't, the fact that I said it made that mm-hmm. made it real and possible for somebody else. You know what I call you that? I, I call I call it once you start talking and visualizing the bricks of truth start building. 
Start mm-hmm. building. I like mm-hmm. that. Uh, I'm going to segue in here. If there was one shoe you could go back and do a redesign on, or there's something that just that one existence where you're like, damn, it did well, but I just hated that. Like just anything that bugs you creatively that you're just like, oh, it's just, it just kills you. You know, is there anything? Uh, yeah, I mean, probably the Air Jordan 2009. Uh, excuse me. Because, you know, like I said, like I always tell people, I second guessed myself during that process. You know, it was one of those where I heard so many voices from people that I looked up to and admired. I thought they knew better than I did what I should do. And, you know, I should have trusted my gut more and went with my truth. I think they would have respected me a lot more. Not to say they lost respect, but I felt like they would have, looking back, they probably would have been like, okay, that kid was right. He had an opinion and we should have listened. Um, so I would say, you know, aesthetically and all that stuff, I can go down the line of saying what I would improve, but it was really, I would say how I, how I responded to the opinions that I wish if I had to go back and, and say, how would I handle it differently? It would have been that. Now, full disclosure, I, I do love shoes. I love all kinds of shoes, but if you start giving me the names and acronyms, I'll be so lost in this conversation. Yeah. <laughs> but one thing I wanted to do, because I want to feel like it's good, is if, if I don't care what shoe and how much it costs, but if you said, Ryan, and I got a, I got a decent shoe collection, but if you're like, Ryan, I want to buy one of your designs, which design would you tell me to go out and buy? And I'm going to go do it. Um, I would say the Dornbecker three. Mm. Because because the proceeds you know go to children's hospitals. Mm. I mean, right now shoe is you know it's a, it's in a reseller kind of world. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. But the shoes that I keep close in terms of what I love doing was the stuff with the children's hospitals because I was a kid in the hospital. I know mm. how to feel. It sucks. It sucks to be a kid in the hospital. Like you, it's not an experience I wish anyone ever has in their life. It's mm. the most heartbreaking feeling as a child to mm. not feel like you're a child, you know? Um, so those projects, man, I love all the athletes I work with. I'm still friends with them to this day. They're amazing people, but nothing replaces the feeling of, of going into a room where a kid just got done with chemo and you show them a shoe that they helped to work on and you see blood rush into their skin. Mm. And they go from being pale gray to being fully alive. Mm. Like that feeling, man, I didn't hail gold medals. I've been in championship games. I've been mm. in private jets. Nothing feels better to me than sitting bedside to see a child feel amazing because of something that I worked on. Mm. Can't replace that feeling. So those shoes, if you were to go and do anything, buy those. If you can't find them, because I know they're really hard to find, just go spend time at the children's hospital. That's mm. a, that's a, that's the best way to support any of my legacy. Is spend time with kids. I, like. I, it, I, I, I can definitely relate to that. We have, uh, I think you guys have the Ronald McDonald House, obviously, in the United States. The Ronald yeah. McDonald House here in Canada, basically what happens is, I think McDonald's funds them 20% and they're on the hook for 80%. That's how it works here. Mm. So I sit on the communications committee and what happens is we go in and we do, um, we have something called the Stollery Children's Hospital, which is with, like in terms of medicine and technology, like it's one of the best in Canada. So mm. it's interesting, but at the very core of it, Basically, let's say you're a parent, you live in a rural community, and your your kid is now sick for two, three, four months. Obviously, financial impact on, on where you're going to stay when you're at the hospital. So a lot mm-hmm. of these parents can't even have a meal. So we'll literally go a few times a month, and we just like pack lunches. You know, pack lunches, go down to the hospital, um, and just talk with the parents and serve them lunch. But some of these kids, literally, man, you know, 20, 30, 40 surgeries, and they're just, they're not even out of the gate. So... Uh, uh, much love and respect and, you know, uh, no words. There's just no words. Um, before I let you uh, tell everybody how, how they can reach you, uh, I just want to do a quick little fire round. So quick questions. Uh, number mm-hmm. one, are you a hunter or a gatherer? Uh, 100% hunter. Okay. <laughs> are you a new addition to a crayon box? What color would you be? Clear. <laughs> okay. Uh, who would win the fight between Superman and Batman? Um, Batman. Okay. What is the number one thing that drives you? My faith. Okay. Proudest moment personally. When my wife said yes. Ooh, man. She loves you. You're so good. Biggest professional accomplishment. Um, biggest professional accomplishment. I would say having a positive reputation when I quit Nike. Okay. How do you define success? Not screwing anybody over. Okay. <laughs> what are you scared of? <laughs> Nothing. Do you have a role model? Yeah, I do. 
Who would that be? You want me, uh, who would that be? Oh, uh, Lucius Fox and my dad. Okay, okay. What is your favorite thing to do? Um, serve, serve others. Okay. When you think of the United States of America, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Potential. Okay. One piece of advice you'd give someone who's scared shitless. Get over it. <laughs> when you hear the word star, what is the first thought that comes to mind? David. And last but not least, what is your shoe size? Same as MJ's. <laughs> what size is the <laughs> shoe? 13. 13. Holy <laughs> man. Some big ass feet. Jeez. Um, and because everybody, you know, equ equivocates to MJ, what is the biggest thing you think? I know you met it, you work with him, but for everybody who doesn't know him, which is obviously a lot of people, I mean, what, like, how has he impacted you? And I mean, is it, mm -hmm. is it when you're in his presence, is it something great or does it become just, I'm just dealing with another human being? Um, you know, the thing that people, several things that I can share about, about M or cat. Some people call him black cat. I call him M. Um, one, this myth that he doesn't do anything for black people. It's a myth. Mm. Um, you know, I'm living proof. We had no affiliation at all. There was no, I mean, we found out overlaps that when I got there, but there was no, he didn't pick me and put, there was none of that. I got there on my own merit and he saw me in motion he personally invested in me to go to Stanford grad school along with Mr. Knight, founder mm. of Nike. Yeah. Um, personally told my parents that he wasn't interested in just me designing shoes, but teaching me business, um, to give me opportunity so that I can go to Chicago, give other people opportunities. So he doesn't, he doesn't seek praise for all the things he's done for people. He doesn't, and he doesn't care that people talk about him and saying he doesn't support black communities. This man has done tremendous amounts of mm. things for black people. He just doesn't decide to put it out into the world. It's not as big. Same thing like somebody like Prince. Prince was the same way. He did a lot for black people, didn't talk about it, which I, I admire that. So that's the first piece. He definitely is, you know, philanthropic for those people he see are in motion that need a little bit of encouragement, a little bit of help. Mm. Um, two, he's a better businessman than he is a basketball player, um, which is scary to say considering he's the greatest basketball player of all time. Um <laughs> uh, I mean, that's in the data proves that I have the, the receipts, not just me as an emotional fan, but I did a deep predictive analytics, deep research project on proving irrefutably that this man is a statistical anomaly. He's a physical anomaly for basketball. Uh, but in the business context, what he taught me was the, the art of qu asking questions to identify the right problem to solve. Mm. So, you know, he he's a he has an analytical mind, a scientific mind. He majored in geography and, and, and astrology. Um, so he understands galaxies and understands locations. So <laughs> he can, you know, he can think micro macro all at the same time. He's a very astute thinker and being around him and watching how he processes vast amounts of information from all these people with competing interests, all trying to either pander to him or impress him. He cuts through it all and knows how to ask the right question to get to the right problem to solve. And that was really beneficial to watch and learn because that's how I attack my life and that's how I attack my business. And third, um, he's more competitive off the court than he is on the court, you know, um, which is even scary to say because the man was a, he was a perfect predator on the court. Mm. He doesn't, you know, he, he, this isn't a phrase he uses, but it's one that I've adopted to myself about being around him and people like him. You know, I don't want to live my life accepting mediocrity as the end result. Mm. I just don't. Mm. You know, I demand excellence out of this little vapor of life that I've been given and I want to do the greatest work of my life. Every single time I touch something, it has to be the best thing ever. The quote that MJ referenced was, was uh, I think it was Joe DiMaggio who said it with the, with the Yankees that every time I step out onto the field, someone's watching me play for the first time. Mm. And I need to make sure that what they've heard is what they see. MJ said that quote, and I'm paraphrasing it. Don't, you know, it could be wrong how yeah, I, yeah. how I yeah, yeah. but MJ said that to me and it made me think like, man, He's right. Every time somebody paid for a ticket to see him play, they were hoping that what they heard he could do, he really could do. Mm. And then when he did it, they were like, yo, that's crazy. He really did that. Mm. So for me, every time I put pen to paper, every time I think of an idea, I'm asking myself, somebody probably is hearing what Jason can do. Jason's creative. Jason can do this. I don't, I can't run off of my reputation. I have to prove it because somebody's going to buy my product for the first time and experience what they've been hearing good for them as it is for the, 
you know, for the for the first person as it is for the millionth person. And so I think about that with everything I touch, like, man, it needs to feel good for the very first believer all the way to when we have a million followers. That mm. a million followers still needs to feel like, holy crap, this is special, this mm-hmm. is different. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it, you have to have a different type of competitiveness because you're competing with yourself at that point. Mm. Uh, and that's, that's what MJ does. He competes with himself. Like, he's in relentless pursuit of excellence from himself. Mm. And it's infectious. You know, when you have the personality and the, like you said, the void of ego where you can stand next to a great man and say, man, that's encouraging. I want to be great, but not like him. But him. That's the best. That's the best lesson that I learned is that greatness comes in many shapes. And and I don't have to feel small because MJ is tall or big, mm. you know, personality. I can be feel big and proud of who I am and what my gifts and talents are. And I can learn from him. And he encouraged that. You know, he wrote me a letter when I went to grad school. I won't share the contents. But when I got ready to graduate, the thing that he put at the end was, Jason, you did it your way. You know, Mm. meaning when I left Nike to go to Stanford, he was like, no matter what people say, you did it your way. Mm. And that, that, that phrase was so important because watching him and him always giving me nuggets, like, don't, don't do what other people do. Don't, don't try to do it their way. Mm. What he said. It was like, all right, that was like me winning a championship. That was like me getting my ring from the Bulls, mm. you know, uh, because that man is the most authentic, genuine person that you'll meet. And I think that shocks people. Mm. I think that they expect him to, to be different, you know, um, but the dude is down to earth. He's a North Carolinian. He's Southern. Mm. He's city. Mm-hmm. He's rich. Yeah. You know, he, uh, he's a. He's an old black uncle, man. That's all he is. <laughs> uh, you know, I always say, do not be, uh, don't make yourself smaller because other people don't know how to be big, right? And mm-hmm. uh, and that is the uh, that that's that's the key, man. Um, I can't thank you enough for for coming on the show. I know that it's a podcast interview, but I mean, when you talk about, I think sometimes we feel alone in the world. And I think, I mean, for me, there's plenty of times when you feel alone. It's isolating. You're trying to do something different. Uh, you you know the the life of entrepreneurship as you know it is a is probably the toughest you know one of the toughest things you can ever do, um, and it's these interviews I do they're they 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 nurture my soul. I literally go back and I replay and I there's certain things I'm the guy that will literally stop and be like what did he say at like a minute and forty six you know I'm a big quotes person because <laughs> my mind is so overactive. If you look at my phone man Jay, like I got a I got a I got a notes folder I got I got a I got a subcategory for a category like because my mind is so <laughs> crazy all the time right i mean i think i have add too but who knows who knows i mean whatever it's a good thing um but you know again with all uh, all humility my last question i have for you is how can i be of service to you and how can i be super heroic oh man i would say you know don't don't be in service you know to me be in service of a greater good so you know definitely um the act of being super heroic is being selfless on purpose but in motion so what that mm. means essentially is everything you're doing with your podcast the things you're doing in your career the things you're doing in the community with your family and you know your child and i, I think just continue to to do that and do it authentically mm. because that's what people people see right people mm. become what they see mm. so when they see a, a man that's jamaican and german in canada who you know who has a beautiful family, who's positive, who's trying to amplify others, you become a possible outcome. Mm. So I would say the, the way that you stand in, in service of others is by living your authentic truth mm. and not being ashamed, you know, to be all of who you are in public on purpose. And that's honestly what we need to encourage all of our people to do because mm. we, we, we don't have a luxury anymore of hiding behind, you know, middle class or upper middle class income and education because all of us now have a target on our back. Mm. And all where, of us. Where, and where are you actually based? Like, where do you actually live? Uh, we live in, in Palo Alto area. Oh, yeah, you do, so. eh? Oh, sh- okay. How long have you lived there for? Uh, man, since we moved back since 2012, 2013. Oh, so man. About, good, yeah. good for okay. you. Good for you. San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. Yeah. Good, good for you, man. No, I appreciate that. Uh, if I'm ever in the area, man, trust me, I'm going to shake your hand one day. It's going to be in the flesh. The Canadian and yeah. uh, and Mr. Maiden. And uh, again, on behalf of the show, um, again, everybody, this has been another episode of the Rhino Show podcast. Jason, thank you so much. Uh, how do people reach out to you or your initiatives or where can they go and find out what you're doing? Yeah, man, just, you know, Instagram at Jason Maiden, um, J-A-S-O-N-M-A-Y-D-E-N um, at Super Heroic. Um, that's our Instagram for the company. And then superheroic.com. Is the, is the website sign up for the newsletter mm. you know there's a lot of information we share through that um, and yeah just 
get involved where you can. Perfect, man. Well, again, everybody, please go on iTunes, Stitcher, uh, Google Play, rate the podcast. And again, you can go to rhinolts.ca or at rhinolts1 on any platform. Jason, it's been beautiful. Happy holidays to your beautiful family. I love you, man. Okay. You're doing great things. And uh, I hope you have a good dinner. <laughs> Signing off. Yeah, man. Appreciate you, man. All right, man. All right, man. Take care, and I'll send you the links. Peace. Peace. Peace.